and my, my hook was melodic. Mm. And I'm like, yo, actually, fuck all that. Mm. Fuck the rapping, bro. Yeah. I say we all just like do the melody thing on oh, this record. Okay. You know what I mean? Let's flip it. Yeah, so, and then that's how we switched it up, and then it came out the way that it did. It, it actually was almost like a mockery. Mm. You know, it was like a gimmick, and it was some shit that we were just like. Um, thinking Alright cool So we just like play, f- Fooling around in the studio yeah. But we're gonna make it Sonically right still mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And That's how that record Came about Podcast And chill Matt G The Ghost Lady And Len Moleko Hinda What me Ladies and gentlemen Welcome to another episode uh, we're coming to live and recharging with Ren, and uh, by God's grace, it's finally happening, this interview. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm chilling with uh, Mr. Cash Time, KO, Super Duper, in the building. Place. Uh, I'm trying to figure out between you and uh, Slicker, because you're both OGs, mm-hmm. who's the original Screw Screw? Because you both have an accent, and I don't know how, where you learned it from, man. Uh, um, I, for me, actually, to give you my real story um i actually finished my high school in the hood oh yeah 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 Yeah, back in the day all my brothers went to like you know white schools and all that um but just with me how i picked up what i currently have it was literally through hip-hop you know i was i was probably more invested in the school of hip hop than I was in actual school. I mean, I went and even graduated in like varsity and stuff, but it wasn't really the main thing. I was I did that by default because I could only come up to Joburg, yeah. um, you know, p- to pursue music only if I'm here studying. You mm. feel me? So, um, but everything that I have, uh, my knowledge, my diction and grammar is I owe it to hip hop. And um, what kind of a kid were you in high school? Were you like, cause you look like an introvert, bro. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I was very introverted. You know, um, I think what I'm going through now, like in the industry, like, well, what, if, if, I, if I can say, um, the shit that I've been exposed to mm. in the game um, and how my personality comes across, it's always been the same. Um, when I was a kid, I think I was. I just, just last week I was thinking, I think I was a depressed kid. You reckon? Yeah. No ways. I think I was a depressed kid, but not in a... Um, I want to kill myself. No, 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 no. But like just depressed on a level where I always wanted more. And unfortunately, because, you know, just like family background and where my parents were, you know, uh, demographically... What would you say to your parents? Middle class? Um, I'd say, yes, middle class, but like lower. Mm. You know, not middle, middle or high, upper middle class. It was low middle class. But, you know, I'm grateful enough that they were able to afford us pretty much the best they could get for us. Yeah. You know, uh, I didn't go to a, um, a hood high school because my parents couldn't put me to you know through a proper school it was it was just one of those things that just happened yeah circumstances you know? so yeah so it just my own personal situation you feel me mm-hmm. um whereas my brothers went to you know uh proper schools and you know we had clothes on our backs um we didn't have you know designer brands or mm. anything like no <laughs> uh, like you know what i mean but like you know a song like on the album is a song called shimmy so if you listen to that record it basically just like almost give you a background um of the type of kid that i was i was always ambitious i always wanted more i was always questioning my parents like okay cool so Next door is a double story. Why don't we have a double story? You know what I mean? Like, you know, um, the pops next door drives a Mercedes. Yeah. How come are we in the in the Isuzu? You feel me? <laughs> so, it's all those questions that I had in my mind as a kid. So I'd say I was just loosely 
depressed just based on circumstances and my desire for more, which is literally the first thing I did when I got into the game, when I was able to, you know, um, you know, accumulate a little bit of income through the music. I wanted to make up for all no the things times. I never had. Mm. You feel me? Like I had to go and buy all pay, pairs of J's. All the Tims, yeah. um, you know, and all the designer brands that I always wanted as a kid. And if it wasn't for your older brother, do you think you would have fallen in love with hip hop? Um, maybe not. Maybe not, because I admired him like so much. He was like a role model. Yeah, he was a role model, and um, but I think I always somehow had a bone for music and for just like talent the crazy enough the person that actually made me want to do this was not even a hip hop artist wow i remember watching a young Tevin Campbell bro Tevin Campbell <laughs> crazy bro <laughs> i remember watching a video of Tevin Campbell um uh, that i saw as a kid it was pre, like, you know, his blockbuster album. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I think it was a Quincy Jones record wow. that he was featured on. And he's a legend, Quincy Jones, bro. You know what I mean? And he was discovered by, uh, Tevin was discovered by Quincy, if I'm not mistaken. I remember seeing this kid and um, also just like when he came out, when, we, when he dropped the, the debut and... I, Little girls at the time, you know, my age, was just like going crazy over this guy. And I was looking at him, I'm like, wow. So this dude is handsome. He's, he's got the talent. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's, he's got everything a girl, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, um, you know, envisions. I want to be, I want to be like him. Wow. You know what I mean? So when I picked up that passion and also seeing like some of the early stuff that Michael Jackson did as a kid, you know, um, Jackson 5 when I was watching that like my uncle was just playing me videos of that stuff and I'm like wow so like this kid I mean cool I, I can it, it's a whole band and stuff it's a whole mm. it's a whole group but it's just like something that draws me to this little kid bro mm. so all those things just like ignited that fire in me as a kid and I always wanted to get into the game but unfortunately I ended up only making it you know in my 20s I wanted to be a child star. Oh, like okay. Like them dudes. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. Yes, sir. Well, what raps were you writing when you were still like in high school? Do you still remember your first raps? Uh, hell no. I just <laughs> remember it was like hella whack. That's all I know. <laughs> uh, but what I, would, what I was doing, I would... Uh, actually, it's crazy. I just got back from a trip in, in Europe. And I went to Amsterdam. So now in high school... Like my last, like grade 11 and 12, there was um, a guy that I met who was an exchange student mm. from, from Netherlands. So we were, he was in the country for like a year. So I came across him back home, white dude, and he just gave me like crazy tapes of like shit I ain't even heard in my life. And mm. then I'm like, wow. Okay, cool. I'm, I know I love hip hop, but I don't know what the fuck this guy like. Where, where the, how, how does yeah. he get this? You know, but obviously, you know, being overseas and stuff, hip hop was a lot bigger out there. So, dude, actually, even um, I mean, he didn't know about this, but like with him giving me those tapes and just hearing those freestyles back in the day and um, the stuff that I was hearing for the first time, I it just gave me the courage that yeah. I cool so. This is really something that you can pursue. You can too, yeah. So, me mentioning the trip in Europe, uh, I had, when as soon as he left the country a year later, yeah, I had never spoken to him until two weeks ago. You kidding? When I got to Holland, bro. Yeah. And I wanted to tell him, I'm like, yo, bro, you don't know what you did for me. Mm. And he still then. remembered you, dude. I was surprised because I mean, back then there was like, internet wasn't really like. Booming, you know, 
but this guy actually has been following wow. <laughs> what I've been doing. He was telling me about yeah. I'm like, how the fuck do you know all this shit, bro? Because <laughs> I'm coming up, I, I, I'm coming up to you, and I'm f- thinking like I'm gonna surprise you and just like tell you about all the great things that you did yeah. and where I am now and the personality that I am back home. Yeah. He's like, dude, I know all that shit. And he started telling me about cash. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> you feel <know what laughs> me? So. All those things, you know, just like shaped me to the person that I am today. And um, so now that like, okay, you're rapping, you found your love for rap, you're writing raps. When you go to your parents and you tell them this is what I want to pursue, what's their, what what do they say? They were not against it. Mm. I mean, back home, I come from a shanty town called Pichu Teeth in Bumalanga, very small. And back then, me being there, Mm. if... By me just saying, yo, I want to be this personality. And back in the day, you know, you had the TKZs and the Zolas and, you know, the Mendozas and yeah. Brown Dashes who were crushing shit. Yeah. And me saying that I want to be an artist and be on TV just like them. Mm. It sounded like, you know, wishful thinking. Mm. But they never killed my dream on that level, mm. you know. Um that's but very they, futuristic of them, eh? Yeah, but they just said, like, all right, cool. I mean, we see that. If I go to school, bro. <laughs> graduate. And what did just you graduate? in case. What did you do? I did public relations. Oh, PR. Um, yeah, in, at VUT. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three-year diploma. Boom, boom. Got back. So that's when you came to Joburg? Yeah. That's, mm. how, that's how I started. Uh, that's, so by me going to um, VUT. VUT made me feel like I was in Joburg literally yeah. you know what I mean because it was just like one taxi away mm. you know for me to come to you know the hardest clubs or like if I want to go see like a Buster Rhymes concert yeah. you know so it what were the like, hardest clubs back then um, there was a club called uh, Le Club hey, I don't even know that bro yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean the OG's the hip hop OG's know that yeah. that was like booming back in the day so that was like the the apex of like hip hop culture because mm. so, you know the DJ Bionics and the Ready D's whenever they were playing out there you know the place would pack up mm. you know um, you'd see a squatter camp out there yeah. Pro Kid is one of the people that were discovered so from you grew up on squatter camp as well yeah 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 shit man same here they man. actually are the reason why I was I mean because I was always a solo artist mm. I mean I was in a group before I got with Tear Gas like uh, I was a duo with a homeboy of mine from back home, but you know things didn't work out, and then I just like started fully exploring, you know, the solo thing, and I wasn't fully confident in it until when we saw Squatter Camp and the success back in the day, and there was a H two O, there was Hidden Force, yes, and all these Murafe. guys, Murafi and. We're sitting there, all right, cool, so maybe the group thing makes sense. So, and when we wanted to get into the game, um, myself, my E, and Dugza, because they were a duo mm. as brothers, uh, we met up with a dude who was our first manager. So, the did idea. You, did you meet them at VUT? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I, I actually found my E there, and Dugza came a year after me. Mm. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that whole friendship turned into a business when we met this dude um, who was our first manager. And he was like, all right, cool. So, I mean, I see you niggas. I mean, you guys are, you know, as brothers, you know, you, you're solid. I mean, I like homie too as an individual, which was me. Mm. But I feel like we can kill two birds with one stone if you guys come together as a group. Mm. And you start off your careers like that, and then you can always explore the solo thing, you know, later on. And it made sense because we didn't have enough resources. So the little capital that we had, we started just like injecting it into kicking off the, the, group, mm. uh, the group's career. And that's how everything started. What is your first song, Is Tear Guess? Chance. Chance! Yep. Wow. Crazy, right? Oh, yes, yeah, dude. That's the record that, like, that got us the deal Yeah Because um, that was a smash As soon as you heard it on radio You're yeah, like No that's yeah, tear gas Yeah so that's the first record That we recorded as a group Yeah um, And a few more others But that one That's the one that got us the deal I like um, So I'm I think that's one of my favorite From you yes, guys sir, man. Yes sir That was a game changing record I mean we were doing the singing shit 
or the melody thing before people were even doing it in hip hop. You know, mm. everyone was still too concerned with like the bars. We did that shit before the Drake's in him. Was it a conscious decision to do yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. The reason why we made that record, I was listening to um, Soul Paid by Akon. Mm, Soul Paid, I'm yeah. so Paid. Yeah. And when I heard that shit, I'm like, wait, because he put it out shortly after his first concert here, mm. right? I'm listening to the chord progression, and I'm like, nah. This shit sounds like this nigga took some shit from, um, you know, one of the old golden oldies from out here. Wow. The progression that almost sounded like there was an artist from back in the day uh, who I knew his music, you know, based on like what, because it's something that my, like, my folks would play at the mm. house and mm. stuff, you know, like on Sunday, you know, like that jazz yeah. shit. Yeah. Um, so there was an artist called Rex Rabani. So I'm so paid actually sounds progressively like one of his records. Wow. I never knew that. So I'm like, nah, this nigga took this shit from Archie. I don't care who says what, right? And then, boom, when we heard that, I'm like, oh, this is so dope. Maybe we should try it as well, mm. you know? Because Akon always came across as, I right, cool, so he's singing, but we embraced him as hip-hop as well, yeah. you know, yeah. back in the day. So I was like, I right, cool, so let's try this shit. And then... Um, Dukes made the beat actually. Okay. Like, you know, he made the first draft and then I took it to Afro Traction. Shout out to the homie. Um, and then Afro Traction actually built it and make it and made it sonically correct. Mm. You know, like the keys and everything else. And then we recorded it. The guys, my E and Dukes are were the first ones to lay their verses on there, mm. right? But it was rap verses. Mm. Right. And then I came in and I recorded the hook. And my, my hook was melodic. Mm. And I'm like, yo, actually, fuck all that. Mm. Fuck the rapping, bro. Yeah. I say we all just like do the melody thing on oh, this record. Okay. You know what I mean? Let's flip it. Yeah. So, and then that's how we switched it up. And then it came out the way that it did. It, it actually was almost like a mockery mm. you know it was like a gimmick and it was some shit that we were just like um thinking all right cool so we just like play f fooling around in the studio yeah but we're gonna make it sonically right still mm. mm. and that's how that record came about and how were you guys in the studio how did you guys work like were there any egos or everybody knew their place now everyone knew their place um we respected each other as a unit mm. you know and always kept it a buck you know, I mean, whether that individual was taking, um, making note of what the other two members were saying or not, but we always kept kept it a thousand percent yeah. with one another. Like, yo, okay, that verse is cool, but maybe you can come up with a better one. And nobody you know? caught feelings. I mean, it would happen. I mean, naturally, as an artist, yeah. you know, when um, your peers tell you, it's stuff is not is subpar. Mm. You know, you will genuinely, genuinely, um, you know, catch feelings. But you need to understand that it comes from a place of love. Yeah, yeah, you know, and yeah. then, um, and then you go back in because at the end of the day, what I think a lot of guys these days uh, suffer from is they can't take criticism mm. because, especially if it's not like destructive, mm. you know, constructive. So they can't take it because they just think like, ah, right, cool. If I mean. One of the people that you had on the show, Caesar, for instance, mm. he's been very um, involved in a I'm lot of stuff. I'm so shocked to watch my show. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> he's been very involved in some of the stuff that, um, that I've... I mean, when I worked on my solo album, when it was kind of Republic, when we did uh, Kara Kara, because we were just going around and just like, getting people's opinions and stuff before we put it out. You know, we went to DJ Spoo, we went to Seasware. Um, I don't remember who else we went to, but Seasware was like, yo, this is a hard joint. But like, you know how that record actually, how we ended up having... Can you have some water there, bro? Yeah. How yeah, we, two, two waters. Yeah. yeah, how we ended up having that... Right mm. at the beginning. Mm. That was Seasware's idea. You're kidding! Yeah. 
Yeah. See, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I've always trusted his opinion. And that's um, the signature of the song. Once you hear that, you know yeah, this is kind of cut. One time. You know what I mean? So, I've always trusted his ear and his opinion. Sometimes, as harsh as it is, you know, I actually see if he says it's not going to work, I know somewhere, somehow, yeah. <laughs> this shit's not going to work. <laughs> you know, so I've always trusted his opinion on that level. And then he. Actually, even with Super Duper, for instance, he was like, yo, this is the song. Wow. You know what I mean? This is going to do really well. And I'm like, all right, cool. And it's popping. If, right I had, if, I, if I've got your opinion and your, your, your stamp of approval, then I know I'm in the right place. And so you give you know, him royalties for that. <laughs> he's my guy. He's my, he, and he's rich, so he doesn't <laughs> need my royalties. Though. Dude, tell me about the game that time, Nay, when Tegas was popping yeah. compared to now. Yeah. Were you guys, are you making more money now or was it lit back then, bro? Um, nah, it wasn't lit, bro. It wasn't that lit. Because back then, hip-hop was still in its infant stages. You know it was a mean? niche. It was a niche market. Not necessarily niche. <coughs> Sorry. Because once um, the peach black afros and the... My bad. <coughs> that water's That coming. water, yeah. That water. <laughs> Do me some good. Um, so when Squatter Camp... Got the deal, uh, first major deal through Gallo and the Salvins and the Proverbs and the Pro Kids and all of them. It changed, it shifted the paradigm, you know, of the culture. So, yes, guys were not necessarily, you know, making as much money as, you know, some of the guys that are now. Um, but it actually just like proved that the there's an actual business mm. in SA hip hop, right? Yeah. They were filling up venues and performing same, you know, festivals as the Mendozas and the mm. Brixes back in the day. So <clears throat> the opportunity to make money was there already, you know? It just all depended on how you were moving as a guy, as an artist, where you are business savvy enough, you know? So one of the my bad. Um, one of the uh, reasons why um, now guys are seeing a lot more money is because there's a corporate buy-in. Mm. You know, there is a lot of um, independent guys yeah. who own their masters, who own their publishing. Um, so when a big deal comes through, it's not like there's another guy that needs to there's no middleman or any exactly. dumb shit yeah, like that. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. So you are those are things of the past. Yeah, so you're not being raped by the label <laughs> saying, I cool so yo uh Vodacom wants to use uh song XYZ. So as the label because I mean by default actually it played out that way. Because by default back in the day a lot of the artists were just signing artist deals. Mm. Right? And uh, the label is risking pretty much everything, and they own the master. So when a Vodacom comes and gives you a sync deal, you're probably holding a, a frac- just a fraction yeah. of that check. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So now, um, you know, things have changed. Yeah. You know, if you own your own recordings and, you know, the publishing and all that stuff. So you like are, Casper with the MTN deal. Yeah, you know, so you're most likely to see a bigger check, mm-hmm. you know, in that whole situation. Oh, cool, man. Uh, while you have some water then, because like, you guys at the pinnacle now is tear gas, making dope music, uh, money's coming in, everything is in place. W- what happened? What was the fallout about? Was it just people growing older? <coughs> you mean, um, for us to go, to go our separate ways? Yeah. Actually, it wasn't really... There was no actual fallout. Yeah. What happened was when we were working on um, the last album, Number Number, um, we were not use, moving in unison mm. anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I remember some of the last shows when we were doing, like that we did. People were saying, you guys are not gelling anymore. Wow, there's no chemistry. Yeah, it looks like Dugza and KO. Well, actually, it looks like Ma'i and, and, and KO are in sync. Mm. 
mm. but mm. homeboy is just like doing his own thing mm. you know and they, they would say we are actually we can pick it up from the crowd so Ndugza killed it, I guess no nah, I'm not saying he killed it <laughs> <coughs> no that's not the that's not the right sentiment yeah um, but like also what had happened at that time when I say we were not moving in unison Ndugza had started um, you know just scratching the surface as far as him embarking on a solo journey okay you know um, we, when we were recording the album but that was always part of the plan like you said from yeah, the yeah of course mm. you know we were not me and my e were not ready mm. you know for that because mm. at that time I had done a couple of features I had done one of the biggest ones that I had done at the time was we were rolling with Ooh, El Tito smash it so when people heard that it was like yo the, the interest for me to do solo stuff yeah was sparked by that record and a couple of other records that I did and God's World with, Keen, with AKA and stuff. So people were like, there was an appetite already mm. for me to do stuff. But I was like, nah, not now. I'm, I'm, I'm tear gas, bro. Yeah. This is, I'm not ready for that. Yeah. So homie pulled the trigger and started launching himself in that direction so we felt like we were forced to also do the same. Mm. You know, he planted the seed and I was like, All right, cool. Plus, there's this um, separation of some sort. Mm. Like as far as the, the chemistry is concerned now. Yeah. So do, maybe... Do, it, do you ever bring it up though? Like do you ever approach Homeboy and be like, yo, what's going on? What's happening? Yeah, we did. We okay. did. Uh, we, did had, we had numerous conversations, you know. Actually, one of the reasons why um, there was an issue, it, it escalated, in fact, when I mentioned to him that, like, he because he, what he did, he put out a full-on mixtape, okay, like, shortly after the release of Number Number, mm. you know, and that was our focus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's your cool. baby. Yeah. And now there's the mixtape, mix tape, you know. So we felt like we didn't really have his full attention mm. um, as far as the group album was concerned and when I suggested that like nah just put out one song test the waters you know he felt like because a lot of people would say yeah the standout guys in tear gas are KO and my E mm. so he felt like he needs to prove himself our, our, yeah he wanted to prove himself and then me saying he should just put out a rec one single ah. song he felt like I was actually trying to hold him back exactly mm. you know gotcha. so things Sort of, kind of got worse mm. uh, from from there, and then um, just based on that and seeing how he was starting to move alone, we also when uh, when I started now entertaining my my, my, my solo yeah. um, situation as well, I um, uh, I made I made the first record that I made was Mission Statement, mm. you know, the very first one just before the album came out. And um, I knew I was always going to be all right, yeah. even as a solo artist. Mm. But I loved the group so much. So much and um, I still wanted to make sure that even when I do my thing, Can they still... still go back. Well, besides that, they, that they also, mm. you know, moving mm. uh, in their own right. So instead of just saying, all right, cool, boom, here's my, so my, my solo record, I said... Let me create a situation. Let me create a situation for my E. And that's how uh, there's a record with Muggs, Pro Kid, and my E by DJ Vigilante called Skelegate that it came out at that time. And then there was also another record that had Kid X and, uh, and Smashes. So the day when I was dropping my solo record, I was like, all right, cool, let me drop that with these, mm. right? And then... By doing that, we are announcing Cash Time Life, mm. the new label, the new venture, mm. right? So as much as Dugza is not in physically involved in those records, he still needs to be part of Cash Time and not as an artist, mm. but as a co-owner. So the business was actually supposed to be split four ways mm. equally right hip hop scholar it was scholar myself my e and it was going to be induced so it's going to be um split that way right quarter quarter 
And then he just like blatantly said he doesn't want to be part of that situation. Wow. So we ended up being the three owners. That's crazy. Myself, Dukes, uh, myself my E, and Hip Hop Scholar. So, and um, yeah, and then that's just how everything played out. Uh, knowing know what you know in, in hindsight, um, if you were to go back, would you change anything or would you just let it play out the way it did? I don't think I, I'd change anything. So many things that have affected me on a, that, affect, that have affected my core as a man because <clears throat> even shortly after that, when Karakara started, you know, happening, um, one of the craziest things was there was, you know, you had people talking about, because I had lost so much weight. I mean, we just talked, oh, yeah. we, we just talked right now um, off, the, um, off the record talking about how I'm back on the strict diet yeah, diet, regimen. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Back then, I think I overdid it. <laughs> so you had folks talking about, yo, this nigga's dying. He's got AIDS. You feel me? Yeah. Um, but actually, with that playing out, with, at the heart of that rumor playing out, that's how Karakara shot up. Wow. Right? So that's a blessing. As hurtful as it was to my family and my partner at the time, mm. you know what I mean? Um, but it just turned out to be a blessing. So with me bringing that up, I mean, I say that to say, I wouldn't change anything, even some of the toughest moments that I've endured as a man in this career, in in in, in this business, um, down right all the way to uh, what had what played out after Cash Time, mm. where like my brand was tainted because of just like the misconception and how you know the label collapsed. And me coming full circle in 2019 and being able to do what I do, I wouldn't have managed to churn out the quality of the music that I've made if it wasn't for the past, the 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 the, the turmoil that the came, pain. yeah, that came with the past hmm. two three years. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I mean, yeah. we wouldn't have Adele if she never, if that guy never fucked up. You feel me? You know what I'm saying? Yes, yeah, that's crazy, man. But then here's my thing, and when you come to Cash Time, right? Uh, every time I watch you in the interviews, I always feel like when that topic ar- arises, you always kind of like beat around the bush. You know, mm-hmm. it's never clear forward like what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always like, no, I did my part. Boom, boom, yeah. boom, boom. Yeah. Well, what actually happened with cash, cash time? It's a, it's a melt, multi-faceted um, conundrum if I can put it in that way there's a lot of pieces yeah it's a lot of moving pieces that led to how everything played out but in a nutshell I'd say when people came on board they came on board expecting to see the same success as KO Mm. right and rightfully so, right? Mm-hmm. Rightfully so. Mm-hmm. Because you're seeing something moving, something that has potential. Brand so, association. Yeah, and then we all have a fair shot at being the as... Star. You know what I mean? But the work ethic Does not was... It, it didn't match the desire, mm-hmm. you know? Um, even just like on a business level, um, scholar came up with a model where he was like, all right, cool. So I'm managing KO and I'm also, you know, heading the label, the day-to-day operation. I, as much as I would, I, I, I want, I can't pay full attention to each and every one of you guys. But didn't so, you know that before signing them up? Then? No, no. Mm. We, we did. We did. Okay. So, now we had to literally strum it in. So, yo, guys, homie can't take care of everyone's career, mm-hmm. like right at this point. Um, so it will help if we have individual managers as well, mm-hmm. you know. And then Scala can be the head of everything, you know what I mean? So... Micromanagement, basically. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, 
no one really what was your dream? followed up on that what was your dream for cash time when you started it my dream to be honest with you and someone will probably say that wasn't the case but i don't give a shit like that's how it's your reality it's my reality and it's something that i still feel even till this day uh, by the way, I mean, we'll, we'll get to this, but I, I'm actually setting up another label real soon. Oh, nice. And I'm going to apply the same principle. So, when I was watching Young Money, bro, mm. I seen how Wayne... Not cash money, Young Money. Yeah. I seen how Wayne, at the height of his run, yep. he said, yo, let's go. Let me bring this guy. Let me bring that guy. I'm going to continue with my shit, but I need you guys to also push as hard as you can for your shit to pop. I don't give a fuck if you end up being bigger than me. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, I'm, I'm okay. I'm always going to be okay. I'm mm. Lil Wayne. I'm rich. Mm. You understand me? Mm. I just have a passion and a vision to see myself changing the game by opening the door. Because, I mean, think about it. So many labels back then in hip hop um, came about but like the guy that was leading like if we talk about Rockefeller we were talking about Jay Z no one was ever bigger than Jay Z bro not even Dame Dash you know what I mean um, and then uh, if you look at G Unit with 50 Cent no one was ever bigger than um, 50 you know so for Wayne to say, being the marquee artist, but yet I'm willing to allow for you guys to grow even beyond me if you have the drive for it. To me, that inspired me on so many levels because you can't be the guy for the rest of your life. True. You True. know what I mean? Yeah. But you can bless others by simply just opening the door doors and yeah. just allowing them to just be themselves. So who and would you say? That's why I wanted that. I, that's my vision for cash time and this is the same vision that I'm going to apply on the next um, you know situation that I'm setting up so who would you say is your success uh, success story because you've been in the game for decades man who's that one guy you'd say you applied that and it actually worked out <clears throat> um, I wouldn't say I fully managed that like to do that because mm. I find myself being amputated while in the course mm. of trying to do that yeah Kid X was on fire, like, when we were together. You know, he was, like, probably the hottest rapper. He's not like on fire on MC. now. I mean, I'm not taking away from... I mean, we are all in a different place right now. Think about it. I'm okay. Myself included. Yeah. It's not as red hot as it was in 2014, oh, 2015. Got, got you, got you. That's, and that's just basically just what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, yeah. The actual, it's actual truth. So... When I say he was on fire, I'm talking about peaks. You know, I mean, 100%. people will say my peak was 2014, mm. and it's facts. Mm. You feel me? So when we were all at our peaks, um, I'd say, like, uh, I felt like if we had built, if we had more years together, that, pr that probably would have been a gr even a greater star. Wow. You know, whether I was still involved in mm, his career or not. Mm. You know, he probably would have been in a much, much, much better place. Um, same goes for, like, someone like Nomuzi. Mm. You know, uh, I felt like 2015 was going to be Nomuzi's year. Mm. And um, the idea was for her to probably even go and fuck around and be bigger than KO wow. in 2015 already mm. you know what I'm saying because she just commanded you know that much attention and you know she just had so much charisma you know it was unbelievable so unfortunately it didn't play out that way and um, uh, so that's what I'm saying like I was somehow amputated yeah. in making sure that like those people's careers played out that way and as a result I hadn't I was so jaded. I wasn't interested in um, collaborating, working in in, in, in uh, developing artists yeah. 
uh, anymore, you know. So now that I'm in a certain position and, and I'm moving a certain way and, um, you know, the people that I'm dealing with now, like Sony and stuff, yeah, you know, they're affording me another opportunity. So, you know, I've regained my confidence as an exec nice. again. So that's what I want to do. And actually now, this time around, it's going to be a lot more uh, calculated than the cash time situation was. Yeah. And I think I can possibly successfully execute the the, the goal vision. that I had mm. you know with the next set of guys that I'm going to be working with I, I don't understand why artists uh, start labels because we've seen it time and again it's like a movie it plays out the same um, cash money you know mm. uh, G unit uh, Rockefeller young money still going bro like, young money still going that's an exception going. that's probably the longest running um, artist led yeah yeah label. yeah yeah yeah. What do you think goes wrong? So, 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 young money apart, like, what do you think goes wrong? Is it a matter of egos? Um, nah, not not even. Um, well, I mean, from what I observe, it's not really egos. Um, sometimes the label just collapses based on maybe if you look at Rockefeller. Yeah. Dame Dash and Jay Z fell apart. Yeah, and Eagles. that was Eagles. the end of it. Eagles, you know. And then, uh, <clears throat> but Jay Z still went and created Rock Nation, yeah. and he's still going super strong with other artists, the Rihannas and all kinds of people. Crazy, yeah. yeah. Probably a bigger setup than <laughs> Rock Rockefeller. Fella. Yeah, you feel me? Mm-hmm. So I think it's just. Um, Sometimes if the label is not really being ran as a business yeah. where it's too much of like the homey thing going mm. on, you'll definitely clash, bro. Yeah. There'll be a, a case where like, you know, someone feels like they're entitled to certain things that the main guy is. And then if they get denied or if circumstantially they can not be afforded the same and then they start thinking all right cool so fuck this situation let me go do whatever that i need to do but like like i can only speak from the cash time perspective us as management we were still intact you know um with the artists yeah you know because you're creatives at the end of the day yeah you know the artists just uh, maybe didn't really have enough faith anymore in the the leadership yeah. of the of the of, of the label. So they started peeling off, and again, it goes back to what I was saying to you: the model that was put forward that yo get your individual managers, you know, to focus on you while. We are trying to run the entire machine. Yeah. But it, when guys didn't apply that and then they turned around and just looked at the cash time situation like, nah, this is not working for me anymore. Let me go do other things on my own. And rightfully so. So we didn't have a an actual contract structure. It was a homey, yeah. family-oriented yeah. business. So, And for me, being an artist also... Because I've seen how artists are just like find themselves like imprisoned mm. by a contract, by a piece of paper. Yeah. Now they can't go do what they need to do. So one of the reasons why we never had contracts, it was purely because our, I identified with the artists on that level that if an artist wants to leave, you know they need to, they need to go. Yeah. Because you can keep them... Um, imprisoned you know to the contract but you will not get their best work bro yeah purely because spiritually and mentally they are just not with you anymore yeah you know so you'd rather just like let them fly as a label you will always find another artist yeah yeah so don't you think going forward uh because it sounds to me like cash time came from a very good place it just sounds like there were no structures you know in place no there were structures the only thing that we didn't have was the contract that's all yeah. yeah, but that's a very fundamental thing. I know, but the beauty about it is, 
the verbal agreements that we had were still in effect, fully, top to bottom. Yeah. Everyone got their just due as far as... Um, Money. Yeah. yeah, so we don't owe anyone a single cent. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the only thing that there wasn't um, was just like the camaraderie at the end. Yeah. It, we just lost that. So from what we've seen, and history has told us, like I said, I mentioned all those labels. Isn't it better, ne? Instead of giving an artist a fish, rather teach them how to fish. So check this out. With what you, exactly what you just said. One of the, uh, the wrong moves or methods that were applied at cash time was I was so invested in seeing everyone prosper that the success of Karakara cool I mean everyone is eating by default and then Coco the record that my E put out yeah. which was a smash yeah, yeah, yeah. was and I'm not saying this to discredit anyone it was my record you know, um, I made that beat with Lunatic and um, the whole concept, you know, go, go. And then I just gave it to my E and then he obviously made it a song. He wrote his own verses. I didn't write his verses, no. Yeah. Um, but the, the hook, you know, um, and he did his own bridge. You know, yeah. those, those were him. But yeah. fundamentally, the that concept, was, yeah. yeah, that was my record. Yeah. That was supposed to be on my album. And then I was like, all right, cool. So. I want to see you. I want you to take off with like something dope. Boom, hold this. Mm. And then the same goes for Bustin' Special by Kid X back then. You know, um, me and Tulu wrote the hook, mm. right? Um, and X helped mold it um, and just like to brush it up. And then he wrote his own verses, obviously. Um, Lunatic made the beat. So. And those were the outside of Karakara. Those were two songs that came shortly thereafter. Yeah. So that's and how. Flew, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean. So back to what you're saying. Instead of giving someone a fish, teach them how to t- uh, teach them how to fish. That's what I did. That's the one thing that I did wrong, mm. right? Um, and then now moving into this new situation, right? I'm. St- Yes, I, I am an exec, yeah. but I still am a producer and a writer at the end of the day. I will still assist when ah, needed, gotcha. you know, um, for my artists to take off nicely for what I think sonically will work for them. Mm. Um, but the So you're becoming back a Caesar. End, <laughs> you're becoming a Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like I'm, I'm writing. This, yeah, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? so, yeah. Now I got you. Um, but the back end of it will be a lot more corporate yeah. where I want to make sure that there's a contract in place and um, that it's, everything is not based on friendship. It's, mm-hmm. just, it's a business. Yeah, it's a business, you know business, what I mean? Because bro. I think that's what now Jay-Z... man. Yes, that's what now Jay-Z, I think when he picked up J. Cole, for instance, mm. that's the first thing that he applied. Yeah. And that's why people were like, you know, but like, why don't we see... You?